Tonight I want to speak to you on the subject of can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? I pay careful attention to all of the contacts that come into our office and communications and social media uh, contacts. And in recent days, this is one of those questions that I have seen over and over and over. Especially now that the vaccine in this COVID era has become such a marked attention getter. People are wondering, and of course I think we've all seen some of the uh, videos and the documentaries and the television and the talk show hosts and the news and the media and all of the controversy that surrounds this supposed vaccine. But I want to take you into the Bible tonight and I want to not only answer that question, but I want to answer several questions concerning the mark of the beast. I want to say in the very beginning of this message, this is not going to be totally focused uh, nor exhaustive. I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel and our podcast channel and our uh, videos that are archived in Facebook and various social media where I speak specifically on the subject in a more focused fashion on what is the mark of the beast. But tonight I want to take you again back into the book of Revelation and let's go down to verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. The subject tonight, can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? The Bible said, then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast. Again, remember the first beast in Revelation 13 is referring to the Antichrist. He required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles that he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life he was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. And then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone, and here's where I'd like you to really get your focus honed in. And if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, highlight this in your Bible. He, speaking of the Antichrist, that coming one world leader required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, we bow before you, and we ask for the help and for the anointing and the quickening of the Holy Spirit of heaven, who is the greatest tutor of all things in the Scripture. I pray specifically for every life, for every listener, those that are present in this sanctuary, those that will be watching through means of various platforms and social media. My prayer is that not one person within the sound of my voice will miss the rapture of the church. My prayer is that not one of them will stand before God in eternity's morning without knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And I pray that you'd not only give them the faith and the courage and the humility in these last days to turn to the Lord, but I pray for their entire family. Give them the ability by the Holy Spirit to receive the salvation that was purchased on the cross 
and freely offered to all who believe in the name that is above all names. And as we spend this time together in the word of the Lord, let the conviction and the compassion of the Holy Spirit be present as our prayer. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said a big amen. amen. When it comes to the subject of the mark of the beast, many modern scholars have questioned whether or not a modern civilized world would ever implement uncivilized means of population control in the 21st century. And certainly we would never segregate or mark men and women and boys and girls with some type of visible mark on their head. Surely that's all forgotten in dark history. But I wanted to just for a moment, because we live in a day and an age in which our young people are being raised in schools where history books have been erased, replaced, rewritten, to give you just a brief history lesson on marking human flesh. Many in the 21st century have forgotten our long, brutal history of marking and branding human flesh for political and religious and ideological purposes. When the mark of the beast, by the way, soon arrives, it will not be the first time that a wicked group of political despots have segregated people and marked them for inhumane treatment, unspeakable, barbaric tortures that cannot be uttered in the presence of children and even marked them for death. Brands and marks have been used throughout human history. These brands were usually applied in a very, very visible part of the body so that all could see. Oftentimes in history it was on the face, even on the forehead. And most commonly it was branded upon human flesh with the primitive use of a hot branding iron. The purpose of branding and marking throughout history was twofold. Number one, it was to combine this incredible punishment upon people, but not only punishment, but public humiliation, to bring terror and submissive fear upon all of the public that witnessed it. The intense pain of, of sensitive nerve endings being seared and the sound and the smell of burning flesh would reduce even the most rugged of men to piercing screams and sometimes emotional breakdown. The ancient Romans branded the Colosseum gladiators used for grotesque sport on their foreheads as they entered with grotesque and visible identification. In the Acts of Sharbal, which I don't expect most to understand that, but it's a text from the 5th century where we read of the various tortures that were inflicted upon Christians and the followers of Christ. Countless numbers of Christians were publicly branded between the eyes and on their cheeks for refusing to offer sacrifices to the Roman emperor. In the 16th century, the German Anabaptists were branded with a cross on their foreheads for refusing to recant their faith and join and pledge their allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church. In the North American colonial settlements of the 17th and early 18th centuries, branding was a common punishment, even in our own country, for people that were found guilty of various crimes. The type of branding varied depending upon the crime. Men and women that were oftentimes convicted or caught in the act of adultery were stripped bare-chested and their flesh branded with a large capital A. D for drunkenness, B for blasphemy or burglary, T on the hands of a thief, SL on the cheek for those that had been convicted of seditious libel, R on the shoulder for rogues or vagabonds, and F on the cheek for those who were convicted of forgery. In the Canadian military prisons, prisons were uh, branded with D for desertion, B.C. for bad character, and usually once they received a branding publicly, they then ended up in some type of penal colony. 
The Jews were marked by the Nazis in the 1930s and 1940s. And time will not permit me to give you an exhaustive lesson on public branding and marking humanity. And I'm not here. Listen carefully. I don't share these dark historic reminders to inspire fear in the audience, but rather I share them with you to remind you of the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the prophet of the Old Testament, oftentimes called the weeping prophet, said in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And from Jeremiah's words in the Holy Bible, this is what I want you to grasp. And if you're taking notes, make sure you understand it. A wicked heart in a wicked man does not change regardless of the century, regardless of the culture, or regardless of the civilization. The problem is not education. The problem is not advancement of society. The problem is sin, and the answer is Jesus. If you believe it and receive it, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. So for those of you who perhaps would like to believe in our civilized 21st century that in our country or other places of the world that people in power will not resort to such barbaric things, you, my friend, need to take another history class. Number one, if you're taking notes, what is the mark of the beast? The Bible states that the mark of the beast is a mark, a literal mark that will be placed on a person's forehead or upon their right hand during the Great Tribulation period. We find that in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16 where the Bible referring to the Antichrist or the beast, it said he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And in the original Greek, that means on the right hand or on the forehead. There is no getting around this. There is no other explanation for this. There is no trying to soften this. The Antichrist in that final political reign of evil, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, which will take place at the end of the Great Tribulation, it is going to be a literal mark. The purpose of the mark is twofold. First, it is a mandated, cashless, economic system that will be brutally and severely enforced. Secondly, it is a permanent and visible sign that you have pledged your total allegiance to global control of this man called the Antichrist and have willingly, and I emphasize willingly, have received his mark of ownership and control. The Greek New Testament uses the word for mark or sign eight times, and Revelation contains seven of those references. All seven refer to the mark of the beast. The word mark in Greek means a mark or stamp engraved, etched, branded, cut, or imprinted. And I've read multiple scholars uh, on this subject throughout the years and it seems that the weight of scholarship rests upon something literal and something visible. The one thing if you're taking notes that I want you to be sure that you understand, it is a literal, visible mark of identification. Now you'll read, if you study the subject, there are many Bible scholars who believe it'll be some type of tattoo or there is a lot of debate among modern liberal scholarship that it's some type of subdermal nanotechnology. Subdermal nanotechnology has gained incredible popularity and is already being used around our world. Some of you perhaps have seen the videos or have seen the television programs where they now have tattoos that you can receive that are actually given underneath your skin. Subdermal tattooing with e-ink. What does that mean? 
and Google it or do your own research on it, but I promise you it'll freak you out. You literally can receive a tattoo whereby it is done underneath the skin and not visible to the human eye. You can go on to your favorite tattoo website that is coordinated with this type of new advancement in tattooing and you literally can handpick and download a tattoo onto your skin and then you can turn it on and it'll show up and be visible like a real tattoo. But let's suppose you have a job interview and you don't want to appear with all kinds of tattoos on your face or your neck or your hands or your arms and you feel it'll enhance your chances to be employed, you can turn your tattoo off. And if you get tired of your tattoo, you can download another one. You can change it every day. And many people are paying attention to these new types of tattoos, subdermal E technology. They actually have them whereby you can have your phone tattooed underneath your skin whereby an actual screen when you get a text, your skin vibrates with this tattoo. And a screen can actually light up and you can take calls and text off of subdermal nanotechnology. It's a fascinating subject and I've spent a lot of hours researching it and reading it. And many modern Bible scholars are thinking perhaps this will be the mark. But I'm going to tell you for what it's worth, I'm not convinced that that's what it is. It may or may not be. I can promise you that when it arrives, I'm not going to be here. And I promise that and hope that you'll be prayerfully absent too. Can you say praise God? But subdermal nanotechnology is being used for everything around the world. From making purchases to opening doors in offices, to using copy machines, logging onto office computers, unlocking phones, sharing business cards, storing medical and health information, securing personal data, financial transactions, and much, much more. It is being advertised in Europe as the next big thing by many big tech companies and Many are glad to welcome it in big industry because it seems to be the perfect answer to ID theft and data security hacking and the end of private hacking and personal information being hacked. It seems to be the perfect solution to these problems which are billion and trillion dollar problems in industries and business around the world. It is taking hospitals across the world by storm and many require it as they provide medical services. Whatever the mark is, the Bible says it will be brutally enforced upon all the world and most likely during the second half of the Great Tribulation. Again, so much time could be spent on that. Number two, is it possible that the COVID vaccine contains the mark of the beast? I'm going to spend a brief amount of time answering this simply because it has come in to our office and been addressed to me uh, in unbelievable numbers just in recent weeks. And I promised on one of my broadcasts that I would give answer to it. And so for those of you that are present and those of you that are watching online and those of you who are listening on some type of social media platform even at a later date or our podcast channel, let me keep my promise. Number two, is it possible that the COVID vaccine contains the mark of the beast? I know of not one single reputable Bible scholar or theologian who would suggest that the COVID vaccine or any vaccine is related to the mark of the beast. In the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast is absolutely not identified as a medical procedure. Even in studying original Greek and dissecting the original author's intent in both text and context, there is no intelligent way to observe proper biblical interpretation and come up with a response that the mark of the beast is connected to a medical procedure or a medicine. The Bible is clear that the mark of the beast is a mark of loyalty and worship. 
Most importantly, the chronology of final Bible prophecy does not allow for the COVID vaccine to be connected with the mark of the beast. And if time would permit, and I hope that you'll take the time to find out and locate these teachings, but you need to understand if you're a serious believer in the last days, you need to give time to studying the chronology of final Bible prophecy, and I will, for courtesy, just give you a thumbnail. First of all, what do I mean by the chronology of final Bible prophecy? What I specifically mean, if you're a new believer or someone just searching out Bible truths, is what is the coming order of events in Bible prophecy? The next major prophetic event on the calendar of God is an event called the rapture of the church. I will go there tonight and read a passage and identify that. But if you're taking notes, the next major prophetic event is an event called the rapture of the church. Immediately after the rapture of the church is an event that is seven years in length that is called the Great Tribulation. People times, oftentimes ask how long after the rapture before the Great Tribulation begins. As I grew up in church and those that I listened to as a young boy, my father was a pastor and always brought in people who preached and taught on Bible prophecy. It was often taught that it was immediate, that it was seconds or moments after the rapture was the beginning of the great tribulation. But with age and a little more understanding and education and study, you really cannot take the Bible and definitively state that the great tribulation takes place seconds after the rapture. It may be immediately after the rapture, but it may be hours, it may be days, it may be weeks, it may be months. The Bible does not offer a clear definition as to the exact timing of the great tribulation in comparison to the rapture of the church, but you can safely say, and I believe the weight of scholarship backs it, that it will be sometime immediately connected to the rapture of the church. It's not going to be centuries. It's not going to be a large span of time. But to say it's immediate, I cannot do that with conviction to an audience that perhaps would look to me for an answer on that subject and rest tonight. When will the mark of the beast be revealed? The rapture is the next major event. After the rapture, the great tribulation. The great tribulation is seven years and the Bible is divided in half into two three and a half year segments. When we study the great tribulation and I have much teaching, podcasts, videos, multiple hours of teaching available on that if that intrigues you or you want to go deeper. But again, just giving you the thumbnail It'll be divided into two three and a half year segments according to the scripture. And the last three and a half years will be escalated to a level of such severity that Jesus said if his father had not shortened the days, none could survive. As you've heard me preach and teach during the seven years of great tribulation, over half of the world is going to be eliminated. Think in terms of four or or more, depending on the earth's population, billion people being quickly eradicated from the earth. That will take place through a series of judgments. Let me help you with something. God has not turned His head on our sins. God has not forgotten His promises and His covenant. He has not winked at the abortion rate in our country and around the world. Millions of babies who have been aborted in this country God has not forgotten a single cry of a single baby torn from its mother's womb and disposed of by trash. The Bible said that the sins of the nations are being heaped up against them for the time of great tribulation. 
We don't use the word tribulation much in the modern era, but the word tribulation from the Bible and from the readers of that era in the first century would have understood the word exactly because that word in its original actually meant a large stone. The large stone from the original Greek that was referenced and translated as great tribulation was the stone that was in every village that was used to grind and pulverize grain into flour. In other words, the readers of the first century, when they came to the letter of John in the book of Revelation and read on the passages of the Great Tribulation, they clearly understood that it was going to be a seven-year window of time when God, like the stone in the common court of every village in every town, is going to grind the ungodly into unrecognizable power. And the Bible tells us that the sins of the nation will be judged. You don't want to be here for that seven-year period of time. Immediately after the seven years of tribulation is an event called the second coming of Jesus Christ. Many times new believers and new Christians are confused in their studies with the rapture of the church and the second coming. They are two separate distinct events. Some would accuse those who preach or teach or evaluate of saying you believe in two second comings. We do not. We believe in one second coming in two phases. Phase one is the rapture before the tribulation. That is Jesus Christ coming for the church. And I'll read that passage in the moments to come. But the second coming is phase two and totally and distinctly different. That is not Christ coming for the church. That is Christ returning with the church. And the Bible said that when he comes in that second coming, he will land and touch the very Mount of Olives in Israel. And when his foot touches the Mount of Olives, he will quickly terminate and end the great tribulation and deal with all of the working parts and all of the evil connected with it. And those of us that return with him are going to rule and reign and begin our eternal work based upon our faithfulness to the Lord in this era. We know exactly when the second coming is going to be, and I'll come to that in the moments to come. Immediately after the second coming of Jesus Christ is a 1,000-year window of time called the millennial reign or the millennium. After that, final judgment, and after that, eternity. And again, this is simply a thumbnail. And four years of seminary or four years of Bible college, could not completely fill in all of the blanks of the chronology and the events that I've just shared with you. But if you're a new believer, I at least wanted you to have in your notes a basic understanding, a thumbnail of the chronology of the events that are taking place. Now with that said, here's something I want you to write down and never forget. The rapture is a signless event. There are no signs in the Bible that speak specifically to the rapture of the church. All of the definitive signs of the end times in the Bible point to what happens after the rapture. But when it comes to the rapture, which is next, it could be tonight. Did you know that there's not one thing in the Bible holding back the rapture of the church in the 21st century? Not one single thing in the Bible that needs to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. Those have all been taken care of. You are living for one of the first times in all of human history where someone who understood Bible could stand and declare the rapture could take place today. What if it took place tonight? What if you left this place and went home and laid your head to the pillow after a long day and fell asleep? But in the middle of the night you were awakened to the sound of a trumpet unlike any you had ever heard before. And the rapture were to take place and the Bible says it will take place in the twinkling of an eye. People have debated how long is that. One group of scientists at General Electric studied it and said it's one twelve thousandth of a second. I've discovered that's a group of scientists with far too much free time on their hands. <laughs> the twinkling of an eye. And believe it or not, books have been written on that. 
Scholars have debated that. Some argue back and forth. Is it the twinkling of an eye, which is actually the fastest human reflex? The fastest thing that your human body can do is the blinking of an eye. But yet scholars actually write books and argue back and forth and say, no, it's the, the sun touching the eye and reflecting. Again, some people need a life. <laughs> Let me give it to you in practical speak. You're not going to have time to pray. You're not going to have time to repent. You're not going to have time to make things right. You're not going to have time to run to church you're not going to have time to call your favorite pastor. And any pastor left behind is not worth talking to. <laughs> You're not going to have time to email your favorite gospel celebrity. And I promise you many of them will be available. They'll be on Facebook doing another fundraiser like nothing has ever happened. Thank you for all those amens. When will the mark of the beast be revealed? The mark of the beast, this is solid Bible gold, write it down, don't ever forget it. The mark of the beast does not yet exist. The evolution of the possible technology may. But the mark of the beast, and I don't say this guessing or speculating, I say this from an absolute biblical view. The mark of the beast does not yet exist. It's not a barcode. It's not a microchip. It's not an RFID implant. It's not your second cousin's prison tattoo. The mark of the beast does not yet exist. If you heard that loud and clear, let me hear a loud amen. amen. A literal reading of the book of Revelation, other end time prophecies in the Bible, tell us that there is a schedule for end time events. And let me help you to understand something else that is of incredible importance, the eschatology and end time Bible prophecy. The government is not in control. No world leader is in control. No body of power is in control. The devil is not in control. The heavenly father is in control of the timing of all Bible prophecy. Jesus said in Matthew 24, No man knows the day nor the time that the Son of Man will return. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Only the Father has control over the timing of prophecy. I emphasize that because I can't tell you how many times I've heard even Christian leaders say, well, I believe if so-and-so is elected, that will accelerate final Bible prophecy, or if so-and-so goes into office, that will slow Bible prophecy down and give us a greater window of time. None of that is biblically accurate. God knows exactly the timing of final Bible prophecy. And we can't speed it up. And we can't slow it down. It is an appointed time. And that time and that control and that authority is in the hands of the Holy Father of heaven and Him and Him alone. Amen. Daniel prophesied a 70-week scenario. I probably spent at least two hours this afternoon editing and going back and forth on how deep I was going to get in to the 70 weeks of Daniel. I finally decided that time wouldn't allow me to do anything other than to give you an introduction to it, and so let me share it with you. Daniel prophesied 70 weeks which refers to, in simplistic definition, 70 sets of seven years. And it marks not American history. It marks God's interaction with Israel. May you never forget this as a student of Bible prophecy. The centerpiece of Bible prophecy is Israel. And in particular... Jerusalem, and in particular for a people group, 
the Jews. And through Christ Jesus, Galatians 3, we have been adopted into the covenant of God and all of the blessings that were given in that covenant to Abraham now come upon the Gentiles because of the cross of Christ and the shed blood of the innocent lamb. You and I now have access to it as well. Praise God. Come on and somebody shout amen. Amen. May 14th, 2018, what happened? The president recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel officially on our behalf and allied nations of the world joined. And most of you just thought it was a piece in the news. But on May 14, 1948, Israel was reborn as a nation. A significant fulfillment to Bible prophecy for it started a final prophetic time clock. The generation that witnesses the rebirth of the nation of Israel shall not pass until all of these things are fulfilled. But did it ever dawn on you of Daniel's teachings of 70 years in final Bible prophecy? Because May 14th, 1948, Jerusalem being recognized as capital by our nation and allied nations of the world, celebrated all over Israel, coins minted in their currency to historically note the day that just happens to be 70 years to the day. 69 of Daniel's 70s have already been fulfilled. The final week of sevens is the seven years of what the Bible called the Great Tribulation. Here's what I would like even for your sons and your daughters to walk away with after listening tonight, no matter how young they may be. I want you to walk away with the knowledge that it's during the Great Tribulation that the Antichrist rises to power If you have your Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. And there is a passage that I feel like I must read in fairness to this question. Daniel chapter 9 and go to verse 24. If you're sitting next to someone that has a Bible and needs some help, if you'd help them locate that Old Testament book called Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 and reading through verse 27 The Bible says a period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people, the Jews, and your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring an everlasting righteousness to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now listen and understand seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with the streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed appearing to have accomplished nothing, and a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and war, and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. Verse 27, the ruler, don't miss this, this is speaking of the Antichrist. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, Let me pause here. Now you know why I've spoke about the Antichrist. The great tribulation being seven years. The great tribulation being divided into half. Three and a half. Three and a half. Here's mention of it. And this is not the only. But the Bible said half this time he'll put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. Now why did I read that passage to you? 
because this passage helps us to know the exact day that the great tribulation is going to begin. Now, if you're a believer, the rapture will have already taken place. But here is the exact day in Bible prophecy where the great tribulation begins, and here's how the world will know it. It may very well be that as I'm speaking to you tonight, somebody has located this message in a frantic search on the internet. The rapture has taken place. The world is now going to hell in a handbasket and things are falling apart and world wars are beginning to take place and pestilences and all of the apocalyptic events of revelation are now all over the world and people, if the internet is still up, are googling and trying to find out things about the last days as they're doing as I speak. Perhaps somebody that's looking at me right now, you've been left behind. And you're wondering, when will the great tribulation begin? Here's when it'll begin. The Antichrist will quickly arise as that one world leader. He will establish the parameters of a one world government. He will go to Israel with ten nations or probably ten leaders of the revived Roman Empire. And as an entourage of power, they'll sit at a table in Jerusalem or maybe in the temple. But there in Israel, they'll sit. And the news cameras of the world, if those technologies are still working, will focus upon him sitting at a seat and pulling out some type of very expensive pen. And the treaty will be laid out on the table. And when the Antichrist's pen touches the paper and he signs this peace treaty, it's obviously a trial treaty because it's seven years. He's negotiated at the table as the one world leader with the various dignitaries and luminaries of Israel at that time. A, a trial. Let's give it seven years. Agreements are made. But when he signs his name on that treaty, he fulfills Daniel 9, and the great tribulation begins on that day. That's when it begins. Now, why is that significant? Because seven years to the day after he signs the treaty will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not seven years by our calendar, seven years by the Jewish calendar. But to the day the Bible prophesies the great tribulation will be seven years where this world, where everything that can be shaken will be shaken, where billions of people are going to be eliminated through various apocalyptic judgments and wiped from the face of the earth in the fierce wrath of God's judgment for stored up sins. And I say it again, please, get ready to meet the Lord while you have time. Because the window of transition is the twinkling of an eye. It is this day that begins the great tribulation. Number four, if you're taking notes, can I accidentally take the mark of the beast? This was the title of my message. I answer it in conclusion. Can I accidentally take the mark of the beast? Because of the rapture, believers in Jesus Christ should never fear getting the mark of the beast. Will you write that down in your Bible and share it with your children and your grandchildren and your siblings and all you love? Because of the rapture, Believers in Jesus Christ should never have one moment of fear or a sleepless night concerning the fear of the mark of the beast. Oftentimes I'm asked, I can't find the word rapture in my Bible. And you're referring in your teachings to the rapture of the church. Where can I find it? There are three classic passages. Let me give you one. 1 Thessalonians 4. And verse 15, go to your Bibles and highlight it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 18. 
We tell you this directly from the Lord, the apostle Paul writes, to this church in Thessalonica that's just months old. It's a brand new infant church. A small but growing group of Christians in a city called Thessalonica. And in Paul's first letter, he writes them too. But in this first letter, chapter 4, verse 15, he said, we tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. Highlight those two words, caught up, because that's the rapture. That's synonymous for the rapture. Correct. The word rapture is not found in the Bible. Once again, time does not permit me to do an exhaustive study on questions on the rapture. I have much teaching available on all of the platforms I've mentioned. Make use of your study time. But caught up, if the word rapture offends you, call it the great catching up. I had a man come to me one time when I was preaching on prophecy and had preached on the rapture. And he came up to me with a, a big Bible that was big enough to kill a bear and pointed his finger at me and called me a heretic. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't upset. I could tell by looking in his eyes his IQ wasn't above the room temperature. And uh, we have to be gracious to people. And so I just smiled at him and said, uh, what did I say tonight that you'd accuse me of being a heretic? He said, you are one of those guys that preaches on the rapture. And I challenge you to take my Bible and show me the word rapture in my Bible. With all of the attitude that these types of people usually are rich in. I said, I'll tell you what. And I handed him my Bible. I said, find the word Bible in my Bible. Because the word Bible is not in the Bible. Some of you are looking like I just said something that was blasphemous, but it's truthful. The word Bible is nowhere to be found in the Bible. The word rapture is nowhere to be found in the Bible. The word one world ruler, one world government, one world monetary. These things that are often used in the study of eschatology and the teaching and preaching of end time events are not always in the Bible, but the terms are. They're described. They're clearly given. They're oftentimes written down in ways to help people to learn and to understand. So if you feel like you need to stone me for using the word rapture, just use the word caught up. It won't hurt my feelings whatsoever. Listen carefully. When it takes place in the twinkling of an eye, this catching up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Ask yourself a question. If the church were going through the great tribulation, if the church were going to be exposed to the apocalyptic horrors of the great tribulation, why would Paul write two books to this infant church of young believers on Bible prophecy and tell them when you're talking about these prophetic events, comfort one another with these words? Because when you study the great tribulation, there's no comfort to be found. And the answer is simply this. The church is raptured before the great tribulation. As I oftentimes teach, the word church is found 19 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. After chapter 3 and verse 22, the church is never mentioned again until closing remarks in the very last chapter. And all of the chapters on the great tribulation beginning in Revelation chapter 4, moving into details in Revelation chapter 6, going on through the book of Revelation, the church is never mentioned one single time. Why? Because the church is gone. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. Listen to what Paul said in his second letter. 
He said, don't you remember that I told you about all of this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back. He's speaking about the Antichrist. What holds the Antichrist from being revealed? What holds him back? Paul said, what is holding him back? For he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Did you catch that? The Antichrist cannot be revealed until something that is holding him back steps out of the way. What is it that has to be removed before the Antichrist can be revealed? It is the Holy Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as the church is on the earth, the church is in control. Taking the mark will be a decision that can only be made during the Great Tribulation and never before. It is a willing decision to give up ownership of your life and swear allegiance to the Antichrist after the rapture of the church. Until then, the world may never know exactly what this mark is until it's revealed. Probably like a new iPhone that's been promised to be revealed on such and such a day, it may very well be introduced in such fashion. It may very well be a great promo of the next great thing. And not fully understood until it's actually revealed. But the mark of the beast will force people to to declare their allegiance to the Antichrist or be put to death. The Bible plainly tells us that all who receive the mark of the beast can never be saved. To receive the mark of the beast means eternal hell. There is no grace. There is no forgiveness. There is no second chance. There is no backsliding coming home. There is no possible reason as to why. No scenario. No justifiable excuse. Once a person takes the mark, they take it willingly and they take it knowingly as loyalty and allegiance to the Antichrist. To worship Him as God. The Bible's very clear. All who take the mark of the beast have no hope. Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue or who accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever and they will have no relief day or night for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. There's no wiggle room My friend, to take the mark, there is no forgiveness. Let me make something very clear to you as we prepare to end this time together. There really is a heaven and there really is a hell. There really is an eternity. And no one goes to heaven by accident. All will be there because of a deliberate choice. No one goes to hell by accident. All will be there because of a deliberate choice. And for those who point fingers of of academic accusation and say, I can't really believe the Bible because it's exclusive. It makes no room for anyone who doesn't believe its pages. It has no tolerance for those who don't accept its truth. And intellectually, I could never believe in a religion that has its way as the only way. Only the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has that thrown in our faces. For the truth is, every major religion on the face of the earth has exclusivity. All claim to be the only way. Because truth 
by its very nature is exclusive. And Jesus made no debate. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Modern preachers may try to soften it and make it more palatable and try to tell you that we all believe in the same God, but we do not. We believe in God the Father, the eternal everlasting creator of heaven and earth. And His only Son is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is our baptizer and our indwelling power. And Jesus Christ is coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. And it's Jesus. Jesus alone that offers us a way to right relationship with God. Hallelujah! So the most important lesson of the evening, and I want every child, every young man listening to me, every young woman, and it thrills my heart to look out over this sanctuary. And every young person that I see has a Bible in their lap and a notebook almost. I'm scouring. I see just about every single one taking copious notes. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was six years old. People say, what kind of commitment can a six-year-old kid make to Christ? I made one that lasted my whole life. Because when you call upon the name of the Lord, whether you're five or five hundred, the Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so I want every young heart to write this down and carry it in your heart all the days of your life. And mom and grandpas and grandmas might be wise to do the same. What is the most important lesson of the evening? If there's only one thing that you take out of this message tonight, may it be this. You need to live ready to meet the Lord every single day. Because the Bible said the next major prophetic event is the rapture. And in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24 and verse 44 said, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. No Facebook prophet's going to tell you when the Lord's going to come. No social media prophet has access to that. And I'm not pointing at prophets and making false accusations. No evangelist can tell you that. No pastor can tell you that. No apostle can tell you that. No teacher can tell you that. No man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man cometh. The rapture is a signless event. There's nothing in the Bible prophetically that holds it back. It could take place tonight. A wise man, a wise woman, a wise teenager, a wise boy, a wise girl will live ready to meet the Lord every day. Let me take it one step deeper in practicality. There's no sin worth going to hell over. There's no man worth going to hell over. There's no woman worth going to hell over. There's no relationship worth going to hell over. There's no worldly pleasure worth going to hell over. There's no achievement worth selling your soul for. There is nothing in this temporary world that is worth trading your eternal soul. Mark chapter 8 says, What does it profit a man? If he gains the whole world but then loses his soul. I love you tonight. I know Bible prophecy preaching for many is difficult. I know Bible prophecy preaching for many is very convicting. But Bible prophecy is not given to scare you. Bible prophecy is given to prepare you. 
But if you're living in that delusional world of liberal scholarship where you think that we are so advanced that we'll never mark or brand or segregate, look around you right now. People in the highest offices of this land have asked that we get databases of people that voted this way and people that voted that way, and they must pay a price. Camps are being built. Laws are being passed. Censorship in the greatest nation, supposedly, has become commonplace. And there is little left in this nation but a false hope and an empty dream. We have become a banana republic. We have become a North Korea. We have become a communist China. We have become a Soviet Russia. And if you think just because Starbucks is still open, we're civilized, you need to read your Bible. We are headed in the wrong direction on an ever escalating pace. And if you don't think the things in this book are accurate, you're gambling your very eternity against a Bible full of prophecies, all of which have come to pass with complete and total accuracy. The Bible has never been wrong. I close with this passage. Musicians, would you come? 2 Peter chapter 3. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, And so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. The time that we currently have, what's left in our nation, and I'll be addressing it tomorrow night in greater detail. Don't miss the message tomorrow night, what will happen to America in the last days. But what time we currently have, the Bible here in 2 Peter says it's because God's willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. It said, He's patiently waiting so that people have time to be saved. And He said, knowing that these things are going to happen, what pure and holy lives you should be living. Are you living a pure life? Are you living a holy life? Are you living with every day a motivation deep in your heart that says no matter what happens today, I want to live ready to meet the Lord. And I want to do everything in my power to make sure my family is ready to meet the Lord. I want to pray and fast if necessary. I want all of my children to be ready to meet the Lord. I want all of my grandchildren. I want my loved ones and even my enemies. May none who followed in my pathway be able to point a finger at me in eternity's morning and said, I followed him and now I'm going to hell. May your steps be carefully orchestrated so that all who follow your faith find their way to the feet of Jesus in eternity's morning. And may all who hear me, may all who hear and receive the word of God tonight, may each and every one hear the Father say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. If you believe and receive God's holy word, stand and give him a mighty hand of praise. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. I never present the gospel without giving people an opportunity to make peace with God. My reason for being here is not informational. My reason for being here is transformational. I want you to genuinely understand that the Bible's believable. And for all of you that went to a college where a professor went out of his way to point fingers of false and accusatory statements to the authenticity of this book, this book is provable through science. This book is provable through biblical archaeology. 
There have been over 26,000 digs in the land of the Bible. Not one has ever disproved one single fact, one single piece of historicity in its pages. Not one single dig. Multiple thousands of them have proven its truth. I said that one time at a college in a Q&A. And somebody said, well, of course biblical archaeology would back it up. It's biblical archaeology as if it were all controlled by Christians. But biblical archaeology, by and large, the leaders and the voices and the prolific authors and data detailers of biblical archaeology are atheists, agnostics, secular, liberal. They only call it biblical archaeology because it's archaeology done in the land of the Bible. And over 26,000 digs, thousands upon thousands, have authenticated detailed statements. Not one dig has ever disproven a single truth. The Bible is not only provable through biblical archaeology and science, it's provable through manuscript evidence. We now know because of the Modern age, for years, they said there were 20 to 24,000 manuscripts, scrolls, bits and pieces of the Bible to give it backing and authenticity. They now have these computer programs where all information in the world goes into a common collective file, as it were, based on subject. And in recent years, it's been announced that we have over 66,000 manuscripts, scrolls, bits and pieces of the Bible. They're actually printing a Bible as I speak that they said will be 99.999% accurate. Many people bristle when you say that and say 100% of the Bible is accurate. There are things that would vary when it comes to commas and, and small words and things of that nature. They're not in any way saying, well, part of the Bible's true. But the most accurate Bible that has ever been produced is being printed as I speak. It's not only provable through manuscript evidence. By the way, I don't know how many of you went to college and studied literature. Homer's Iliad has the greatest body of evidence in manuscripts at less than 1,800. But nobody questions Homer or Iliad or Aristotle or Socrates and so on. That's taught as if there should never be a question mark. 66 thousand manuscripts, scrolls, bits and pieces. No book is as high as this book. Provable not only through manuscript evidence, provable through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a provable fact. But most importantly, provable through prophetic content. No religious book in the entirety of the world civilization where records have been kept contain detailed prophecies. Only the Holy Bible does. Almost one-third of the content of the Bible is prophetic. Over 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. Over 2,000 of them fulfilled with complete and total accuracy. Not a single error. If you're betting your eternal soul against the Bible, don't ever fly to Vegas. The Bible's not just believable through childlike brainless faith. The Bible stands every intellectual test of higher criticism. And you can build life and future and eternity upon the content of its pages. I'm asking you tonight to take an honest look at your heart right now and ask yourself one simple question. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've gotten down on bended knees in the presence of a holy God and repented of your sin and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Because though I receive all kinds of questions on Bible prophecy, I also receive a, another question very commonly. Tiff, tell me specifically what I need to do to get right with God. So let me do that. Three things have to happen to have peace with God. Number one, you have to recognize your sin. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're here tonight and you've never sinned, please raise your hand high so we'll know that you haven't taken your medications and the ushers will come and help you. All have sinned. But many have never confessed God. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. 
Jesus said, unless you repent, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There has to be a day of genuine repentance. That's another word we don't use a lot of in the 21st century. Repentance simply means make a U-turn. It means you're headed in the wrong direction, make a U-turn. It means turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Christ. So when I give the invitation to pray together, before you go that way, make a U-turn. Come this way. And we're going to pray together a simple sinner's prayer. I'm not going to keep you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not asking you to join a church. We're not going to ask you to get a denominational tattoo on your forehead or right hand, I promise. And thirdly, you must receive Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, the life. The only one who died on a cross for sinners. All other world revolutionaries and religious leaders ask their followers to give their lives for them. Jesus was the only world revolutionary and religious leader who said, I came to die for you. And he rose again. And his grave is empty. And he said, I'm coming again. So that where I am, there you may be also. Worship team is going to sing a song of invitation. And as they sing that song of invitation, listen carefully. By meeting me at this altar, I'd like to have the privilege of praying with you. If you want to kneel, you can kneel. If it's difficult physically for you to kneel, you can stand. If you have an elderly grandparent with you, or maybe you're elderly and here on your own, and it's even difficult for you to stand, People in the front row will happily give you your, their seat. But I'm going to ask you to do this because I believe it's the only biblical model that is seen in Scripture. And not only that, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. He said, if you confess me publicly before men, I'll confess you publicly before my Father. But if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father. Everybody Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. Every apostolic sermon in the book of Acts, they called the people publicly. Billy Graham, my hero in evangelism, used to say, there's something about doing it publicly that seals it and makes it sure. Everything in life that has significance, we pretty much do it publicly. We honor our war heroes publicly. We graduate from school publicly. We graduate from college publicly. In higher education, our degrees are conferred upon us publicly. When you dedicate your life in marriage... You stand at an altar before family, friends, and God and repeat vows publicly. There's something about doing it publicly that seals it and makes it sure. I've often wondered why. Perhaps the reason is that you will have a forever moment that you'll never forget. Because I have a forever moment. I was six years old. I remember it like a video playing on a TV right now. Just like I remember my wedding day, June of 1979, the 23rd, standing at an altar before family, friends, and God. I'll never forget it, because my wife will kill me if I do. I remember. And by praying the sinner's prayer with me tonight, you'll never forget. If anyone from this night forward ever asks you, did you ever make peace with God? You'll say, oh, I remember. It was in January at the beginning of 2021. There was a church there in Arlington, Texas. I don't remember the guy's name. I remember he was redheaded and ugly. But he invited me to come and pray. And I went forward and I prayed with him. And that night my life was changed. Your life will change. That's the promise of God. He said, if any man or woman comes to Jesus Christ, they become a brand new creature. 
Old things pass away and all things become new. All of your sin, all of your past, everything you've tried to hide is not only forgiven but forgotten. We're human. I can't forget when people wrong me. I can forgive them, but I don't have the capacity to forget, nor do you. But God said when He forgives your sins, He said, I not only forgive you, I forget it. It is wiped from the records of heaven, never to be spoken of again. You have a new life in Christ tonight. By coming to this altar and praying this sinner's prayer with me, you're saying, God, in childlike faith, tonight I recognize my sin. Tonight I'm willing to repent of my sin. Tonight I receive Jesus Christ. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I receive the mark of God's forgiveness never to be marked by the world. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I'll serve the Lord. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I receive the forgiveness of God. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I want my life from this day forward to be an example so that all of my friends and family who follow in my path will have an eternity in heaven together. And we're going to pray. Let me make it very clear. Those of you that have the courage, I'm going to ask you to be the very first ones to come. Your courage will help other people who just don't have the courage you do. That's human nature, and I've just lived long enough to know it's true. Some people do this easily, and it's not always the big biker that's got the backbone. It's the little girl. But those of you that have the courage, you be the first ones to come. I promise you, your courage is going to help somebody else. Christian, I'm going to ask you to do what I ask every night in every Lost Lamb event around the world. I want you to be very sensitive by the Holy Spirit to the people that are sitting nearby. And if there's someone nearby, maybe a guest friend or someone you've invited, and you're not sure if they've ever made their commitment to the Lord, just turn to them graciously and say, if you'd like to pray, I'll walk with you. Whether you're doing it for the first time, or you're a backslider away from the Lord and tonight you need to come home. I'm going to kneel here and I'm going to pray and ask God to give you the faith and the courage and the humility to make that decision. The worship team is going to begin to sing a song of invitation and I want you to come right now and then we'll pray before we're dismissed. Would you come? Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Come on. Of Jesus, it washes white as snow. We're going to pray together with those of you that are at this altar. I'm so very proud of you. I know it's not easy to do what you do. It always takes humility always takes faith, always takes courage. Those of you that are at this altar, we're going to pray this prayer together and we're going to pray it out loud and without shame. There are many of you that are watching in some format, watching us live, watching us on a replay, watching us on a video, watching us on a television program, listening to a podcast, 
But you need to come to Jesus right now, and I haven't forgotten you. I want you to know that this afternoon in my hotel room, I prayed for you. I specifically said, Father, not only those that will be live and present, but in this hour in which we live, in which things are shared and replayed, reach across all of the barriers, wherever you're at. You can pray with us right now. And I want you to do that. Those of you that are at this altar, let's pray together. Say, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. The Bible is accurate. The Bible tells us heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Tonight in childlike faith, I trust the Bible. I trust in the cross and in Jesus and in the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of my sins. Tonight I recognize my sin. I repent now. I turn my back on sin. I turn my heart to Jesus. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Wash me. Make me holy in your eyes. With the blood you shed on the cross, cleanse my mind, my body and spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross. And though you died, you rose again and promised you'd come one day for me. So this night, I receive salvation. You said in your word, all who call upon your name shall be saved. Tonight I'm saved. I am no longer the property of sin. I am tonight a child of God. The curse of sin is broken and the blessing of God is now mine and I'll never be the same. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to walk in your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise.